I messed up my YouTube algorithm. Now, this isn't a new thing. I'm not breaking any news to you or saying anything that you haven't heard before a bunch of different times. In January, I was swept up with the Packers hype, a rebuilding team with Jordan Love at the helm. So it was easy. Now I know how I messed up my YouTube algorithm. But something a little more strange started to happen when the football season drew to a close. YouTube was recommending me videos I had already watched before. Now, not some random meme video from my high school days, and not one or two here or there. My homepage was cluttered with videos that I had seen within the last week or so. Now, this seemed like something new. But then again, I messed up my YouTube algorithm, and that isn't anything new. So I set out to do what I normally do when something wacky is going on at YouTube, and that's waited out. But this was a bigger, badder, stickier problem than the normal shenanigans that normally go on at YouTube. Because before I knew it, it was mid-August. I could no longer flame football. The season had gone and was returning again. I began to fear for the digital content in my life, afraid that it would never be the same. That Grandpa YouTube had begun to swerve between the lanes on the highway, going 30 miles an hour, and no one was around to take his keys. I couldn't just stick my head in the sand anymore, so I made a simple Google search, looking for a simple answer. Why does YouTube keep recommending me videos that I've already watched? But this simple search didn't have any simple answers. It didn't have a fix that I could just do and move on with my life. So now my two or so weeks of research, with no fix, is your problem too. Enter the murky depths of recommendation algorithms with me, and if we can't make it better, let's at least figure out how we got here, and maybe even answer the question most asked by humans. Why? For those of you with a less curious mindset and for whatever reason are allergic to two-minute videos that claim to have all the answers or reading, and you ended up here, let's cover some of the fixes that the wisdom of the endless internet have to offer for us. First, according to posts on Reddit or blogs never before seen by human eyes, you could go through your watch history and remove any offending videos that are similar to what you're seeing that you don't like. Now, this obviously doesn't work for us. This doesn't work for seeing videos that you've already watched before. On the off chance that it does work, you're going through months, maybe even years of YouTube watch history and trying to find one video that you've clicked on two times in that same span of months or years and removing the second click. It's time consuming and it's not even guaranteed to fix your problem. Next, you could reset your YouTube search history and your watch history entirely. Now, this really doesn't work either, because chances are, if I'm seeing videos that I've already watched before and reset my entire account, if I go back into content that I'm used to watching, I am going to have more videos that I've already watched before appear in my recommended page. I've already seen these content creators. There are many videos that I've already watched. I won't even know if all of this is gone, what videos I have and haven't clicked on. I'll have to guess. And that doesn't fix the problem either. These don't work for me. But if this solves your problem, you're welcome. Leave a like and subscribe for more Quarter Watched videos. All right, they're gone. Now we can get into the real good stuff. The niche fun facts that get you uninvited to parties and the nitty gritty of how this all works that gives you a deer in headlights look whenever you try to explain it to somebody. The first interesting fun fact may seem a little like common knowledge now, but a big breakthrough in an article published by Hulu nearly 13 years ago titled Hulu's Recommendation System was that we were more likely to click and watch videos recommended to us based off of our recent watch history rather than our general watch history. Now, if you don't think this is a big breakthrough, just think about the last YouTube rabbit hole you fell into, with the little recommendations on the side allowing you to fall deeper and deeper into that rabbit hole. Now, this is a peak example of this at work, recommending something similar to what you're literally watching right now. The next is less of a fun fact and more of a hope that we can return to simpler times. A time when explanation was, and I quote, one of the most important components of every recommendation system. Now, it seems like these days on YouTube, the only device you can find an explanation for your recommendations is your TV, with bars of videos given to you based on topics. But the moment you go to your phone or your PC, these explanations vanish. 
When talking about fixing our personal content hell we put ourselves into, not having an explanation makes solutions, like removing the right video from watch history, so much harder and so much more time consuming. While it doesn't seem to matter when trying to fix the issue of constantly finding videos that I've recently watched, honestly, not much at all does. And that's why I'm making this video instead. While I'm on the topic of the YouTube algorithm and the recommendation system itself, making it harder to fix problems you run into with it, let's switch gears and move to the YouTube paper. Deep Neural Networks for YouTube Recommendations. Something that I found reading this that was really interesting was that YouTube picks a random point in your watch history and, and again a quote, only input actions the user took before the held out label watch. Now, not to beat a dead horse here, but again, while this could be really helpful making your recommendations feel more broad and almost novel at times, it could make it really tricky to find that one video in your watch history that seems to be messing up your recommendations. Because if you think you may have found it, it might not even be within the range of what's bringing you your current recommendations. Now, not to be completely negative, every so often I'll search for a video to fix my car. Now, if you're worried about how this will tie in, just look at the play bar. It's okay, we'll get there. Every time I make one of these searches, I'm terrified that my content future on YouTube is in jeopardy. But more often than not, everything is fine. The YouTube paper does seem to have an answer for this, but the fact that my recommendations are fine when looking up a car repair video seems to be more of a happy little side effect of YouTube withholding dates from your search history in their model. They state that the purpose of this is to avoid recommending on extremely popular recent searches, like to stop when you search for Taylor Swift, your entire recommended page being Taylor Swift. Now, why would it matter what searches are popular? Way back when video streaming was just a fad and cable was king, web engineers and math nerds got together and figured out a way to get people the videos that they scoured the basic HTML landscape to find. The mathy boys said, Hey, um, you, you remember those little squares you did in high school biology? And the engineers said, Yeah. But it squares. You got genetic information of either parent on two sides of the square in the middle is what the, uh, what the kid has going on genetically. Then the mathemaniac said, Exactly. We've been cooking up something those biology guys never could. We added a bunch of extra math to those squares. The engineers replied, But there's more than two characteristics of what's going on with the video and what's going on with the people. Let me stop you right there. We can expand that square into all kinds of dimensional space. We said we added a bunch of extra math, didn't we? <laughs> we can put all kinds of characteristics of those videos on one end and a bunch of preferences for people on the other side. We call it matrix factorization, said the math nerds. The engineers said, you son of a bitch. Let's do it. Sketches aside, there's two different ways to organize your matrix factorization. The first is item-based filtering, which is much like what was sort of described, where the videos or items have their characteristics all laid out on one side of the grid and the preferences of the users on the other side. And in the middle, it matches the users with the items that match their preferences. The second way to organize your matrix is called collaborative filtering. This is where your items are laid out on one side and users laid out on the other, much like in item-based filtering, but some users have rated some items and through a process that even when broken down pretty simply by an article from Great Learning, linked below, I don't feel comfortable explaining effectively, so we'll just call it complicated math. Through collaborative filtering, rather than matching users with items that match their preferences, it matches users with items based on matching preferences with other users. I legitimately looked up if it was possible to use both systems at the same time, and it appears that, yes, hybrid systems are very possible, and just based on the vast amount of money that these platforms have, I think it's safe to assume that they do in fact use some sort of hybrid matrix factorization system. I say all of this because collaborative filtering is dominant in the space, extremely dominant. Recommending you anything from videos to products on Amazon is much easier when you're matching your customers with other customers rather than trying to match your customers with what they might want. Beyond this, even back in 2011 when Hulu released their article, nearly five years after matrix factorization was introduced as a concept for recommendation systems, Hulu was using collaborative filtering as a control F replace for matrix factorization, replacing collaborative filtering with user-based collaborative filtering and item-based filtering with item-based collaborative filtering. 
it seems as though this might be because collaborative filtering is the algorithm itself, whereas matrix factorization is the broader system. But what I can say pretty confidently is that collaborative filtering is huge in the space, maybe even to the detriment of our current day recommendations. Item or content-based filtering through multiple sources has a few benefits. It seems to be really personalized to you, allowing your recommendations to bring you into niches because even content that isn't as popular but matches your preferences will still be brought to you. Another unsung benefit to this is that not as much user information is needed. You'll still need some, but you'll need less, which is a positive for all of us in privacy. The last benefit that Hulu brought up in their article is that it's easy to bring explanations for your recommendations, tying back to before we brought all of this complicated terminology into the mix. Maybe a reason that we don't have explanations for what we're seeing is that it's much harder to bring those explanations to us. Words from Google themselves back when they wrote their paper state, we observe that the most important signals are those that describe a user's previous interaction with the item itself and other similar items matching others experience in ranking ads so while hulu's big breakthrough was that recently watched helps drive engagement youtube's was that user-based filtering or collaborative filtering is much more important to their system and looking at the current state of things, looks like it was the foundation and largest building block for their algorithm moving into today. A small part of the Hulu article was feedback and how they receive it. Explicit feedback, what we rate and how often we rate it, made up a small part of the feedback that they actually received. I have no reason to believe that this has really changed much, so these systems are largely built on our implicit feedback. What we watch, how much of it we watch, do we binge it, so on and so forth. Our own lack of making known what we prefer may have put us into this suboptimal system and may have even been a well-intentioned seed to start gathering data on us, growing into the massive scale we know today. Our lack of providing explicit feedback could be how this all started and ad sales and how effective they were shown to be is why it continued or even ramped up. The last thing that I wanna bring up from the YouTube paper is that they mentioned creating new features, but in figure six, one of the features shown was example age. The information that YouTube has on us are the features. In their own words, they use hundreds of features as a part of their algorithm. Some of this can be discounted as small bits of information like logged in state or even information on the video. But we aren't talking about tens of pieces of information. We're talking hundreds. And you can't discount everything away. Our experiences, our information is our, is our, the features. With all of this in mind, I'd like to ask a question and kind of a simple one at that. Is it worth it? Our recommendations that go on the fritz a few times a year that are made harder to fix by the nature of the systems in place, worth having someone else's recommendations become our own. Is our information being a key feature of connecting us with other people to have recommendations that don't feel like our own worth companies having it? Was not hitting the like or dislike button a cost we're comfortable with for what we have now? Thanks for letting me drag you along on this journey and have a good one.